Hey everybody, Tyler with Bedford Camera and Video. This is Bedford Talks Episode 2, Season 2, Episode 2, and I'm very happy to have Ryan West sitting here with me on this awesome blue couch. <laughs> and, uh, and It is really nice and it's soft. It's, yeah, it's yeah like this a, is awesome. Yeah, it's like a suede or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like your blue suede shoes, except it's a couch. Yeah, I don't know yeah, how yeah whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool, it's cool. It's, it's, it's an old song, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For all you youngins out there. Yeah. Look so. up Paul McCartney. No, I'm just playing. I just like really confused him. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Ryan, we're uh, very happy to have you on uh, thank Bedford you, thank Talks. You. And uh, I think you're the first filmmaker to be on Bedford Talks. So kicking it off with the moving image. Okay. I'm sure you, do, I'm sure you do take stills, but oh, yeah. uh, you know, I think this will be uh, an exciting uh, exploration into what you do. And I've, I've known you for, for a couple of years uh, uh, you know, not super extensively, but you know, we've seen each other at uh, PhotoCon, and mm -hmm. uh, especially when we did PhotoCon Live. Yep. I remember you're helping us out with that, and that was a lot of fun. Yep, and, definitely uh, a behind the scenes kind of guy. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. So for sure, absolutely. But uh, Ryan, for those that don't know you and uh, don't know the work that you do, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. So I have been doing some documentary work for the last few years, and. Before that, I was doing general photography, or I was doing some editorial photography, so I was shooting for magazines and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and um, worked with some nonprofit organizations and did, you know, bigger story type stuff with mm -hmm. that. And I, I've also shot your weddings and your seniors and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but that's just not really my cup of tea. I really like being a documentarian. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but yeah, that's the type of stuff that I really enjoy doing and the stuff that I've been lucky enough to get paid for for the last several years so so yeah that's really cool and you're also uh, are you in the Oklahoma City area like in the city or uh, do you just kind of move around are you kind of like a, a nomad uh, what where do you call home um, so yeah I am originally based out of the Oklahoma City Edmond area um, mm -hmm. I grew up in Edmond my whole life and so but for the last couple of years or last two or three years I've actually been out on the eastern side of the state um, doing a documentary and mm -hmm. so uh, but right now I'm kind of between places, if mm -hmm. you will. Uh, half the month I'm here in Oklahoma City, half the month I'm back there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just, you know, kind of wherever I need to be, I guess, so. Now in the work that you do, do you tend to find that you're shooting long or are you shooting wide? Is there a particular focal length that is, uh, I wouldn't really say a signature kind of move for you, but is there a particular um, way you like to shoot? Do you like to really get into the action put your body in there or do you like to observe from afar? So I really gravitate and absolutely love the focal length of 35 millimeter. And where a lot of people do portraiture with like a 50 is wide for a lot of portrait photographers. Mm -hmm. For me, that's a little on the long side. And the reason being is going back to the documentarian type stuff there's something about an environmental portrait that I really love in actually showing more than just the person and going to stop down a little bit, you know, show a little bit more of the background, stuff like that. I absolutely love that. And so, yeah, I definitely gravitate towards the wider end of the normal spectrum mm -hmm. of lenses um, just because of that environmental portrait. If you look at a lot of the people who I draw inspiration from whenever I do stuff like that, you'll notice that they will typically use a little bit on the wider side, mm -hmm. like that 35. Rarely would I ever take a portrait at like 24 mm -hmm. or something like that. But, oh, sure. But yeah, I just, and it obviously it depends on the shot, but I could do just about everything on a 35. Mm -hmm. You know, I could get close up details if I really get my lens in there. You know, sometimes I might have to be a little careful of sparks or something like oh, that, but sure, that's a little yeah. different story. But, uh, but yeah, as far as the stuff that I prefer to do, if I could have one lens, it'd be a 35, which ironically enough is the one lens I don't have right now. Oh, that's so, interesting. So, yeah, uh, it actually broke several months ago, and I just haven't gotten anything. <laughs> I haven't replaced it. I've got other lenses. I've got like a 16 to 35, and I've oh, got a 24 right. to 70, so I always have that range, but... Mm -hmm. I don't have a prime, I don't have a 35 millimeter prime that's functional right now. Oh, sure, so, yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, I think that's, that's great insight because I'm even thinking of uh, documentaries that I've seen like social docs, um, you know, in, environmental, uh, you know, docs. So uh, I'm thinking of like 
well, this maybe not a great example, but part of the movie was uh, the Cove. I don't know if you've seen uh, mm -hmm. the Cove, uh, but it's uh, it's you know it's about uh, illegal fishing, okay. um, and so of course they are shooting much further out because they're trying to be covert. But uh, they're shooting in a car and they're they're filming other people out you know while they're in the car, but shooting out you know trying not to be seen. Uh, but I think there's something to be said for um, shooting a little bit wider, shooting deeper, because you want to get not only your subject, but you want to get their reaction to what's going on, uh, interaction with others around them. So it doesn't have to be, you know, it's not, we're, we're not looking for, you know, overt beauty. We're not looking, you know, right. for a, a big cinematography award, although I know there, uh, that certainly does happen in, 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 the, in the doc world, but um, you really want to get, all the context for the story you wanted, and you also want to be prepared for what may happen. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I think you're right. I think a 35 really fits that mold. Yeah, and it's it's just one of the shots that tells the story. Um, you know, one of the things that I've told to a lot of people who are interested in doing, you know, document like documentarian type of work, and just being able to tell a story in general is that you always want a wide, a, uh, a wide, medium, and tight shot, right? Because in order to really tell the story, you want the wide to show the, the time and the place. Mm -hmm. You want the medium to kind of give a, pers like a, a perspective that everybody's used to. You know, like a 50 millimeter, they say, is close to like what the human eye sees. It's, right. you know, 45, 50 millimeter. And so you give that sense of, um, how do I want to say this? this just a sense of realism, mm -hmm. a sense of commonality, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're used to seeing the world in that focal length. Mm -hmm. And then you want the tight because you want the details. You want like the little, you want to pick it apart. And so, mm -hmm. you know, wide, medium, tight. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's just something about that 35 that just. Now, usually when I have photographers that are, you know, photo only, uh, we get into the subject of post-processing um, and the, the post-production side of things. Uh, I know you do shoot some photos, and then when, earlier we were talking about time lapses. I know we, we kind of share a uh, love for shooting time lapse, mm -hmm. uh, showing that, that movement over time. Uh, what is what is uh, a subject matter that you like to shoot uh, in your photography, uh, whether that's for you know, paid work or your own work, uh, and also time lapses? What, what's, what's something, what's a subject matter that you're, you're, you're going on? Man, it depends on the day. Um, I, sometimes I feel like I'm all over the board because I really like shooting street photography sometimes, mm. but I also like going out in the middle of nowhere and doing a time lapse of clouds moving across the mm. sky. And I also have a camera that's dedicated to macro photography. Mm. So, um, so yeah, as far as subject matter goes, I typically find a lot more in the natural environment that I really like to, that really draws me, especially for like personal work and stuff like that. And so, yeah, um, time lapses are one of those things that I really get into. And it, I have a love hate relationship because sometimes if you're out there for six hours doing one time lapse, that's gonna take like 10, 15 yes. seconds to elapse in the final video. Um, it's kind of crazy, but the post-processing of time-lapse is more intensive on my computer than any el like anything else that I do mm -hmm. because you're taking hundreds if not thousands of raw photos and uh, have you ever used LR time-lapse? I've, I've seen it used. I have not used it uh, myself. I usually, well, I'm usually processing it either uh, in Final Cut or in DaVinci Resolve, uh, which, I mean, you're taking a, what, 5,000 by 8,000 pixels, depending on the, you know, the size of your sensor, to uh, uh, down to 4K or 1080. And so it's really throwing away a lot of that information, yeah. you know? Or if you're using the R5C, you know, it's like megapixels. 45 megapixels. So it's like 8,000 by what, almost 6,000 mm -hmm. or something like that. And, you know, even shooting on the compressed raw, uh, you're, right. it's, it's a lot of data for your computer to process through. But LR time lapse, I'd highly mm -hmm. recommend you looking into that. And one of the, it's, it's great because you. That's you, a plugin, right? So or is it its own thing. It acts as kind of like a plugin for mm -hmm. Lightroom, but it's also a standalone now too. Okay. Um, and so you can actually make quite a few adjustments in the program and not really take. I can't. I can't remember. It's been a little while since I've actually used that portion of the program, but 
as far as LR time lapse, you pull everything into LR time lapse and you set keyframes. And if you ever want to do like the holy grail time lapses, mm. oh, are, right. are you familiar with that where it goes from like day to night or night yes. to day? Mm. Um, like, yeah, it's so, like a full 12 hours, 14 hours, something crazy like that in some cases. Not even that. Yeah, sometimes, absolutely. Um, but just to get that perfect transition from, you know, daytime, then you get the sunset and then you have the night. And mm. so your, your exposure changes quite a bit throughout that mm. time because you could be going from you know, a couple thousandth of a second to a few seconds whenever right. you're talking about the photos at night. And so you're gonna have these pretty big jumps in exposure. And so LR time lapse gives you that uh, ability to set keyframes whenever you manually adjust the camera. Mm -hmm. Cause you, you, you manually, set, uh, manually set the camera and then you'll just change the exposure as you're, you pay attention to your light meter and stuff. Mm -hmm. But anywho, so yeah, you'll set your, your keyframes import them into Lightroom, and then you just match all the frames how you want it to, and then whenever you plug it into, or then whenever you bring it back into LR time lapse, then it'll auto transition all of your adjustments from frame to frame. And so that's how you get like those perfect transitions. And mm -hmm. it's a really powerful program, but it's also a really powerful program. So you gotta have a lot of computing power. For sure. So yeah. Yeah, because I think we're both using uh, M1 Max chips mm -hmm. in both of our, because I, I have an M1 Studio, uh, and and that the, that M1 silicone is really something impressive. It's got a lot of power. It really so, does. <laughs> yeah, I've got the MacBook M1 Pro Max uh, with the 64 gig, mm -hmm. and so I basically maxed it out, and I mean, for a laptop, it's going to compete with almost anything else that's out there. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, LR time lapse is definitely one of the most taxing things I can throw at that computer, mm -hmm. any computer really. So, I mean, it could still take 15 minutes to process a time lapse, which, right. which is bad. super fast <laughs> compared to what it was. Cause before that I had a Dell computer and shoot, I would, it would take an hour, two hours sometimes mm -hmm. to process like a relatively small time lapse. So, oh, yeah. and at the time it was a pretty decent desktop too. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, um, but yeah, time lapses are fun. Well, yeah. and also investing in tools to, because time is money, you know, and, and even if you're not doing it for money, but it's, you know, your time is still valuable. Uh, I shot my friend's wedding and I was, it was on that, we're talking about the Black Magic Pocket 6K. Yep. And I was shooting in 6K because I'm like, I can, you know, manipulate it. And uh, I was, it was an older uh, 2015 iMac uh, with like an i5 or something like that. And <laughs> the processing I needed to do just for the ceremony was a 20-minute ceremony. And it, it, it struggled. It took about three and a half hours. And I'm like, this yeah. is insanity. And then I, just out of curiosity, I... Pull, open that project again, and I did it on my M1, uh, my M1 Max Studio, my M1 Studio. Uh, Twelve minutes. It was, it was like, yeah, it was, it was less than real time. I remember yeah. that. Like, I remember. Uh, well, all I know is that if I'm in Resolve, because in the 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 deliver page, it'll tell you. Yeah. Obviously, you know the duration of the project itself, but then it'll tell you how long it took you to complete mm -hmm. that job. If I see it's it's at least real time or less. I'm super happy. I'm like, this is great. Yeah, if you actually notice up in the viewer window, as it's processing the video or as it's exporting mm -hmm. the video, it'll actually tell you how many frames per second it's actually processing. Mm -hmm. And so on my computer, if I don't have a whole lot of edits that, or if I don't have a whole lot of stuff that's done to the clips, mm -hmm. if it's pretty basic, if it's just like a lot and some like little minor tweaks, mm -hmm. I've seen upwards of 300 frames per second <laughs> wow. on a 20, three nine eight time oh, timeline yeah. and so yeah you're talking more than 10 times the yeah. the real speed or mm -hmm. uh, of real time so a 10 minute clip would take you a, a minute right like yeah it's insane wow <laughs> so yeah but then i've also thrown some clips with some pretty heavy noise reduction i was doing That's some way super low light stuff one time and it was I was kind of testing the waters a little mm -hmm. bit, and so I threw on a... Was this in Resolve? Or in yeah, this was on Resolve. Okay. Yeah, I've only re used Resolve for the last three years. Mm -hmm. So, 
because I had the Pocket 4K and it came mm -hmm. with it. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it was optimized. It was a studio version, so it was optimized yep. for to fully be yep. used. Yeah. And so at the time, I was paying for Premiere, and I also had DaVinci. I think this was DaVinci 16 is whenever. Mm. Now we're on 18. Yeah, I started um, on 15. And the yeah. free version just, and it just taught myself, yeah, you, just, you know. Yeah. And the greatest thing about Resolve is that once you have it, it's like it just you just keep getting every version. Yes, of it. exactly. So, um, but uh, yeah, so I definitely had the Pocket 4K and got the studio version. Mm -hmm. Stopped paying for a Premiere um, just because... I didn't want to mm -hmm. pay the twenty something dollars a a month. Oh yeah. So and this was also during the pandemic, whenever you know work dried up, and so it's like <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get a single job this month or not. So yeah, why why? So eat you know twenty dollars, fifty bucks a month. Yeah. Twenty dollars of rice goes a long way. Mm -hmm. So so yeah. Well, thankfully you didn't need After Effects or anything else. Yeah. You know, then you'd have to jump up. Because, uh, I mean, talking about time lapses, when I was uh, one of the better time lapses early on that I had done, um, I was it was uh, I was doing, I guess, like a hyperlapse, but I was mm -hmm. uh, rotating around a structure. It was a, it was a building, and it was it looked really cool. I, I didn't have my shutter speed slow enough, so it looked very staccato. <laughs> yep. But um, I took it because there was a certain part of the building that had to, that I, this is how I envisioned it, uh, I wanted it to be in a, I wanted to keep that consistently on a certain part of the frame. And so I took all my images into, uh, I processed them in like Lightroom or whatever, you know, the RAWs. Um, and then I took all of those into After Effects and frame by frame, I re realigned them and, mm. you know, put my, my smart guides and realigned it, realigned it. And it was, I think it was like 300 frames. So it took quite That's a bit of a time. Lot of work. That's not even. But it looked really cool. <laughs> no, it was it was <laughs> seconds. Yeah. But then I did have some people go, "Whoa, what was that?" Like it was it was kind of them in the middle of this video, and they're like, "Whoa." I mean, if that's a if you're doing at 30 frames a second, I mean that's a 10 second time lapse. Mm -hmm. So and that's a couple hours worth of work at least. I think it so. ended up being, oh, maybe five seconds. So it might have been fewer frames than that because I it was going. I had it going yeah. very quickly, but it was just, again, one of those people kind of, you know, they, they were talking, you know, and it, this was for a church, so I was keeping the, the cross of the building in in a certain spot, and uh, this was playing as people were walking in, and I saw several of my friends go, what? <laughs> and just like, they had to, they were like, well, hold on, <laughs> what, did you see that, you know? And so I yeah. was like, okay, that, that got their attention. So I, I wanted to do that again, so I'm starting to do that more often. I've seen some people online doing the hyperlapse thing, yeah. uh, which that is a that is a time intensive thing. You're not just let, you know kind of set it and forget it. Uh, the time lapse mode on a lot of our cameras. No, you're moving every frame, like three feet every frame to do this. So yeah, that's one thing that I've just I haven't done, and it's not because I don't want to. It's just sometimes I just get lazy, but. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I'll I will do hyperlapses with a drone sometimes, oh, depending on yeah. as long as it's not a windy day. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten some really awesome hyperlapses from the drone. Mm -hmm. And so I've I was using the Air 2S for a while, mm -hmm. but I now have the Mavic 3, and having those longer flight times, like at actual 30 minutes of flight time, right. you could actually do some really cool stuff. So especially with if you do keyframes and stuff, but right, yeah, yeah, ramp so it. Yeah. yeah, and so well, one of the really cool things is that you have waypoints that you can do, mm, okay. and so you can pre-program. So you can basically say a waypoint here and here have this long, and you can do a, a hyperlapse in that, and then come back, and it, you you can save those waypoints, mm -hmm. and then come back and do oh. it at like sunset or at night or something like that, and gotcha. so the drone will fly like it'll go up and then it'll start and then you can do like a, a really nice transition between mm. the two two hyperlapses and so you get kind of really like that cool. you kind of get that like day to night like the holy grail almost right or sunrise sunset something <laughs> along those lines um and so yeah you could do some really creative stuff and it's a lot harder to do it with a tripod mm. than just a regular camera and doing the same thing because you have to unless you have points on the ground where right. it's like you move each time mm -hmm. but with a drone i mean the drone just goes off a of gps and so yeah, if you have your waypoints and so yeah. you just it pops up it goes right to the same altitude and everything <laughs> else and um 
yeah, it's just, so yeah, hyperlapses are super fun, mm. and they're a really interesting way to see time pass mm. in a lot of situations, especially if you have like moving subjects, whether they're crowds, which don't fly over crowds. Um, let's unless you want to get arrested, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> or I hurt, mean, or hurt people when it falls. Yeah, yeah get your part one hundred seven. <laughs> you'll understand all this stuff. Um, but um, but yeah, especially with like clouds mm. or. Like if you've got river or something I've along seen those lines. Construction projects yeah. in the same way. Obviously, if, if you're if you're in New York City, you can just find a tall building close by where that happens. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense if you want to have it at a certain altitude, uh, you know, a certain you know coordinate, and then uh, um, you know, facing a certain direction. You do that every day over the course of however long this project is. You can get some really incredible uh, progress out of that. Yeah, there's a video that I saw one time, and it wasn't a hyperlapse. It was just a regular video. Mm. Um, but somebody was using, I think it was a Mavic 3, and it was somewhere, I think it might have been around the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, yeah. And so he shot a video. So he, he, he made these waypoints and then um, started shooting and, like, going, like, kind of... Uh, flying towards the the Golden Gate Bridge mm -hmm. and then so he saved those waypoints and then he came back like 30 well he uh, flew it like another 30 minutes later as the sun was coming down and so he had like this really cool transition between day and sunset mm -hmm. and you could just see like this like it was just a really cool fade mm -hmm. um, and so I really that's something I haven't actually done it with a hyperlapse but that's one of the things that I really want to do is I I've I've experimented a little bit with it. I just haven't like fully invested mm -hmm. the time in it. So um I just haven't flown the drone a whole lot recently. <laughs> so So keeping the innocent anonymous, do you have any embarrassing stories, anything that happened to you or something you witnessed on a shoot? I can't really think of anything too embarrassing off the top of my head. I'm sure that there are stories, and if anybody, if you any just of my friends, that, it down. yeah, if any, yeah, I've, I've repressed those memories. Um, but it's also one of those things that you have to let things embarrass you in order to be embarrassing. Um, but there's definitely been times where I've been on shoots and lenses have dropped and broken half, and um, yeah. I, I thought that my roll of film had completely wound back into the oh, canister, man. and then you open yeah. it up, and it's like. And then you have people that are around like, is that bad? And I was like, we're good. And just <laughs> You just kind of like cram it back and just grab your other camera. I you lost know, go a from few there. frames. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just lost a half a roll of film. That's fine. But um, one thing that I do remember, and it's not so embarrassing, but it's more about like what it takes to get the shot. Mm. And I remember I was doing a project with a friend and she has had some difficulties in her life and so we went around to a lot of things and had like a lot of juxtaposition type mm. of shots. Sure. And so she spent a lot of time, or she spent a lot of her life in the hospital. So she had a gown and she mm -hmm. had like an IV pole and a bag and stuff like that. And so we were just kind of like, her illness kind of goes with her wherever she goes kind oh, of a sure. thing. sure, yeah. And I remember we were in this little town one time and we found this creek and there's kind of like this little split. It was almost like a small little island and mm -hmm. the water was going around it. And there were, the, the banks were really steep. Um, and so there wasn't really a good place for me to actually f get a good shot of that without getting in the water. Mm -hmm. But the problem was is that it was like 34, 35 degrees outside. <laughs> and so really the, the only way to really get really cold the, the, really the only way to get the shot was to strip down to my skivvies and get almost waist deep in this creek which wasn't even a nice creek i mean oh. it, it's an oklahoma creek so you know it's not it's kind of muddy and mm -hmm. it's kind of dirty um and yeah i just got out there in the middle of the water and i ended up getting a pretty decent shot and actually I can't, no, it was on a RB67, not RZ60. I, oh, that just yeah. reminded me of yeah. it. Um, but yeah, it was. It ended up being a really good shot, but I remember I spent probably 15 minutes in that water, and it was absolutely frigid. And so, yeah, here I am, just some random dude with a 
you know, I think I might have had a hoodie on or something like that, but I'm just wearing my boxers, you know, <laughs> like mid thigh high in this creek. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, good times. You got to get the shot, you know. Should, some, should have invested in some waders, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, I even took off my shoes, my socks, my pants. It's good stuff. <laughs> so Anything for the shot, right? That's right. You know, I mean, you can kind of dry off a little bit whenever you put your pants back on. You're not as wet. As, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, got to gotta manage it. So. Something early on I learned was, it doesn't matter if you look dumb, especially if you're in a place where no one knows you. If you look dumb to get the shot and you get the shot and it looks awesome, totally worth it. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there's a reason why you're not on the other side of the lens. Yes. Right? It's like nobody cares what you look like. So, yeah, if you have to climb a tree and, you know, hang from a branch and it's like, you know, it's like, you know, getting all kinds of contorting and everything. I mean, we've all been there. So, yeah, um, that's definitely one of the things that you will learn if you want to get the shot in some circumstances. Mm-hmm. you got to look a little weird. So you got to work for it. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You know, not everything's uh, done in the studio where everything's pristine and clean. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, you know, if you're going to be outside, you know, especially if you're doing documentary stuff, there's been times where I've been filming and it's been snowing on the ground mm-hmm. and um i've been in rainstorms i've gotten some really awesome shots with thunder just rattling off in the background looking like fireworks Mm -hmm. and these guys are sitting there working and doing this construction project and it you know it's like okay i think we i think we can you know if we if we get out of here in five minutes we'll be good and we weren't good so um i remember the rain started coming in and we were up on a third story and so we came down this little wooden ladder and um we actually had to seek refuge on the second floor oh. because so much water hit us so fast that it created a waterfall going down the stairs wow and so yeah there's Man. been some pretty hairy situations and you know especially whenever i'm carrying around a camera and it's not waterproof yeah you know <laughs> like there there's a difference between waterproof and like weather resistance yes you know if it's weather sealed some or like all of my cameras have weather sealing but that doesn't mean that they're going to survive a down like an actual downpour mm. so uh so yeah got to get the shot though i mean it looks cool <laughs> so well, and sometimes that can make or break the sequence. So Absolutely. So, yeah, especially earlier, whenever I was uh, earlier in my career and I would be out in a rain, you know, it'd be raining or something like that mm-hmm. outside and my camera would get wet and I, I wouldn't care, like I couldn't care less, but then I would take a picture of it and be like, I'm trying to water it and, you know, oh, like, yeah. like grow my <laughs> megapixels, you know, like, all mm-hmm. the, you know, stupid humor like that. Yeah. So, but yeah, I don't think about that stuff anymore because now I'm like, I've got a lot of money invested in this camera gear. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, I, it's either buy the gear for work or put a down payment on a house kind right. of a thing. Like, it's that kind of a money that you're talking. So, like a substantial amount of money oh, on yeah. a house. Oh, yeah. You know, so, but. Suddenly those uh, $12 rain covers, you know, <laughs> just make a lot Look more real sense. real cheap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whenever you're talking about that kind of stuff, it's like, buy that stuff in bulk and actually one of the things that i've done is so depending on what i'm doing i have different bags Mm -hmm. but in every single one of my bag uh every single one of my bags i have rain covers just the cheap little ponchos Mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah um from that you can get at the optech uh, ones yeah the ones at bedford yeah uh not so i have those too Mm -hmm. but even just like the really cheap clear ponchos oh just the ones you wear yeah the ones that you wear and I'll usually have a couple of those um, because those Optech, I have those too. Mm-hmm. And I also, my dad has a really fancy, I think it's a Think Tank. Is it's it think like tank a neoprene thing? one? Uh, it's not neoprene, or, but it, uh, it, it's like a heavier material. Mm-hmm. And it's got like some little clear windows, mm-hmm. but it's like a heavy cloth, like mm-hmm. a, a water resistant. Right. Um, and I may have stolen that a few times from my dad. <laughs> um, but yeah, at least if you have something Mm-hmm. Um, just in each one of your bags, it comes in real handy. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a I have a little fanny pack for whenever I'm doing oh, macro yeah. stuff. There's one in there. 
I've got uh, my travel bag that is a think tank, um, mm-hmm. one of the roller bags. I've got one or two of them in there. Um, I've got an F-stop bag, mm-hmm. and I've got a couple of them in there. You know, it's like everywhere I go, I have at least something that I can throw over the camera if I need or mm-hmm. over my bag, um, which I also have the bag covers too. But, mm-hmm. yeah, th- that's one of those things. Um, you know, Alex was talking about just getting caught in an absolute tr- uh, um brainstorm Mm -hmm. at a wedding or something like that and it's like you know her the weather that they were planned on had zero rain in the forecast and so Mm -hmm. all of a sudden now they're sitting there in a a torrential downpour it's like you know if you have something with you so that's a really good handy thing to have with you Mm -hmm. so on any shoot that you may be on what is an accessory that you always have in your bag that is a must have yeah it's nothing fancy you know i don't have uh really fancy things that i like to carry in addition Mm -hmm. to the camera and the lens but the one thing that i don't leave home without is an at least one extra battery and an extra memory card Mm -hmm. um the amount of times that there has that i've shown up to a shoot and you know the night before you lay everything out Mm -hmm. and it's like okay battery one battery two battery three and then you get there and it's like oh my camera was like the, the, the switch was turned on mm-hmm. in the bag on the way to the shoot or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever had that, but you know, yeah. it, you know, having an, like a backup for your backup battery. Mm-hmm. Oh, th- yeah. there's something uh, very humbling about that first time that you realize you needed it mm-hmm. and you didn't have it. So if I'm shooting in an interview or something along those lines and I, you know, I've got a tripod or something to Mm -hmm. set the camera on. One thing that I've started doing is I always put gaffer's tape on the legs of the tripod on the upper section of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to hide microphones a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my favorite method is to do the paper football method. Right. And so then you just sandwich it and then you put it between the, the buttons of a shirt or something like that. Right. But on every single one of my tripods, I have several uh, bands of gaffer's tape that are an inch or less wide. And it's come in handy so many times, whether it's to mic somebody up or to uh, strap or to tape a a cord to a tripod. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you're going to be booming over uh, a light over somebody's head and you have the cable to the light and stuff Mm -hmm. like that, it's like just being able to secure those and Mm -hmm. even taping the cords down on the ground yeah. gaffer's tape comes in handy so much and it's just like gaffer's tape comes in just as handy as having a pocket knife or something along those lines that you just carry with you everywhere mm-hmm. so um so yeah gaffer's tape i like that get it at bedford's <laughs> that's right <laughs> I mean, your nearest store or online at bedfords.com. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, gotta throw that in there somewhere. Actually, no, I will say that whenever you guys started carrying in the Oklahoma City store, the little mini rolls of gaffer's tape, that's yes. like an inch wide. Yes. Oh, man, I went and bought several of those, and I put one in my roller bag. Mm-hmm. I've got another roll in my macro fanny mm-hmm. pack. Oh, Cause, yeah. Because you got to have a fanny pack if you're doing macro. Yes. Like, Yeah. But then I also got a roll for my mom because my I got my mom into macro and so she oh, also yeah. has her fanny pack now and so yeah we we look super cool whenever we're out doing <laughs> macro, um, but yeah gaffer's tape those little mini rolls are awesome oh yeah, so you know what are they four or five bucks or something like that exactly. and they are worth a million dollars whenever you need them well you know on the so. full rolls I I end up finding uh, finding myself taking it off and then ripping it down lengthwise so it. I'm glad they started doing that. Yeah, the amount of times that I've actually used a full width gaffer's tape to the amount of times that I've actually torn them and made strips, mm-hmm. uh, it's a very uneven ratio. Yes. Um, yeah, probably 90 times out of 100, nine times out of 10, I'm going to be tearing it into like thinner strips. Mm-hmm. So just A, to make it go further. I mean, mm-hmm. you don't need you know, what is it, two or three inches wide right. to like strap down like a cable on a, right. on a tripod or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's funny. The situations that I've used gaffer's tape in. Mm-hmm. So like making little cradles to like hold remotes for doing like time lapses. Right. And, you know, it's like, 
yeah, I should have taken a picture of it, but yeah, I literally made a cradle and I even had like this little strip that came up mm -hmm. and I just like, what, I hung it or I taped it to the tripod and it just kind of dangled there. Right. But it was kind of a weird spot in the connector on the remote because this is back before we had time-lapse features or interval right. or intervalometers That's built what in I the would cameras. do. I would tape it to a leg. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I've made, as I said, those little cradles. I've done all kinds of stuff with mm -hmm. the tape. So... It's um, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's tangible. What is something intangible? What's something always on your mind on a shoot? Uh, definitely the 80-20 rule, where 80% of the shoot is the tried and true methods of um, stuff that you know is going to work. Mm -hmm. And then that extra 20% is going to be something that you allow for creativity, you allow for experimentation, and if none of it works out, you still have the 80% that covers everything, mm -hmm. right? So if you can tell the story in that 80%, you're golden. But a lot of the times, those shots that really make an impact come out of that 20%. Mm -hmm. And so, again, going back to getting in the creek where you know I, I took off my right. pants and <laughs> I, it's 30 something degrees outside, it, there's literally snow on the ground mm -hmm. and um, you know, that's part of that 20% where it's taking a chance and try, like doing what you need to do to get the shot. Mm -hmm. And so that's always in the back of my head whenever I'm doing a shoot is make sure I have deliverables, but then also have some fun. Like mm -hmm. that, that extra 20%, it, it's, it's got, it's multifaceted because you have you get to think creatively. You get to be like, you know what? What if I do climb that ladder? Or right. like, like, what if I do climb on the roof or something? Or, um, hey, there's a crane. Can oh, we get my. on top of that? There's that actually uh, one of those photos. Oh yeah. Um, so this was shot. Oh, wow. This was shot on a mag or for a magazine. Uh -huh. And I actually got to That's climb the to. Capitol building. Yeah, this is the Oklahoma City Capitol building. And I actually got to climb to the top of this crane mm -hmm. and got to actually get out on this counter boom wow. and take photos and that's 300 feet above oh, the ground man. and so some of the shots that I got from it were they actually look like drone shots mm -hmm. but it was actually me being 300 feet up in the air mm -hmm. so uh, yeah that was super cool but that's one of those situations where it's like you know sometimes you just got to do something crazy yeah and exactly it was it was awesome because everybody that's asked me about the the like whenever I cr climbed up on a crane mm -hmm. was were you wearing a safety harness or anything like that and I was like I was wearing a hard hat <laughs> right. but as far as strapping me in there wasn't a single thing that actually strapped me in and I'm not gonna lie there's a few parts where if you move six inches then you, it was a 300 foot fall yeah so um, at least you would have had that the hard hat on. <laughs> no, actually, it wasn't even strapped on. Like, you know, it's just a regular hard hat. Like, like, yeah, my head's kind of round. And so it just, it would have just fallen off. Like, there's, right. there's not a whole Too lot of yeah, resistance. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, so yeah, um, definitely the 80 20 rule. Um, that was taught to me by another photographer. Mm. And ever since then, it's just one of those things that has always kind of been in the back of my head. And mm. it's definitely made a difference on some of the, the work that I've done. That's so, cool. So yeah. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk with us and, and just get real nerdy. I'm, Absolutely. I appreciate it. That's where, that's where my comfort zone is, is getting nerdy about camera stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. And how can people follow your work? Uh, so they can, look at, they can look me up on Instagram. It's Going West Productions. And so don't get too excited. I don't post there a whole lot. <laughs> but um, most recent stuff has been some macro stuff but yeah going west productions on instagram awesome awesome well ryan thanks again and uh we hope to see you on the next episode